Greetings, church family. Today's daily Bible reading had us in Romans chapters 3 and 4. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 20, all are unrighteous. One of the greatest deceptions the world has ever fallen for is that none of us are really born evil. Some believe that mankind is born as essentially good and just tainted by things of this world as they grow. Others believe that mankind is born as blank slates, which are shaped either for good or for evil by the people and events of their lives. But God's word makes patently clear this is false. In fact, this section of Romans mirrors Romans 1, pairs up with it as those mighty expressions of the total depravity of mankind. In verse 4, we see Paul's first use of the declaration me genoita, that's in Greek, and it's translated here as may it never be. Paul uses this phrase 13 times in his letters. Ten of those instances are in the book of Romans. And it's part of a rhetorical device in which Paul follows up a key truth with a rhetorical question reflecting a wrong way of responding to that doctrine that he just taught. To correct such wrong thinking before it takes root, Paul hits the reader with a meganoita, may it never be. So for instance here, in verse 3 of Romans 3, Paul asks the question, Does the unbelief of some cancel out the faithfulness of God to save the lost? Answer, meganoita, may it never be, verse 4. Then Paul refers back to David's prayer of confession and repentance from sin in Psalm 51 to remind his Roman audience God is perfectly justified in his judging of the sinfulness of mankind. In fact, the very fact of God's just wrath in response to mankind's unrighteousness brings up another opportunity for potential wrong thinking found in verse 5. Since our unrighteousness is the catalyst to the demonstration of God's righteousness via his just judgment, does that mean that God's wrath is somehow unrighteous, just as we are? And again, Paul responds, make anointa, may it never be. After all, he rightly argues all mankind, Jew and Gentile alike, are guilty of sin and thus guilty and deserving of the condemnation, the wrath of God. That is the righteous response by our righteous God. And Paul drives home his point in verses 10 through 18 with really a, a, just a machine gun series of Bible references from Psalms 5, 9, 10, 7, 14, 1 through 3, 36, 1, 53, 1 through 3, 140, verse 3, and Isaiah 59, 7. Notice all the absolute statements made here. None are righteous, not even one. None who understand, none who seeks for God, none who does good, not even one. And of course, verse 18, there is no fear of God before their eyes. Well, because of the unrighteousness of mankind, our works cannot justify ourselves. We're, we're so thoroughly full of iniquity that we can't do anything to save ourselves. The word justification, so very clear. How important this word is in the book of Romans, but in the Christian faith in general. Getting this term wrong can mean the difference and has meant the difference between heaven and hell, truly, between eternal life and eternal destruction. Justification is not being made righteous. That involves a process. Justification is being declared legally righteous in the eyes of God. To be justified means that God takes a wicked sinner and by his grace, through their repentant faith in Christ Jesus, not because of their repentant faith, but rather that's the, that's the, the tunnel that God's grace works through to save the Christian's soul. That is how a person is declared legally right in the eyes of God. He has to graciously save. He's the one who regenerates. He's the one who brings about repentance from sin and faith in Christ Jesus. Isaiah 64, 6 makes clear that, that we cannot be made legally righteous over time. All of us have become like one who is unclean. All our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment and all of us wither like a leaf and our iniquities like the wind take us away. We must be declared legally righteous. And then the sanctification, the process of sanctification begins in which over time the Christian turns away more and more from sin as it approaches in their life as their flesh manifests that sin and 
repents daily, having this characteristic of repentance, and continues to turn to the Lord in putting off sin, putting on righteousness, and growing in Christ's likeness. But the justification, that's that being declared legally right in the eyes of God. We cannot justify ourselves. So how is one justified? The answer we see in verses 21 through 31. Righteousness and justification proclaimed. How is one justified? What can a person who's definitely unrighteous in God's eyes do to be declared righteous by him? Well, we gave the answer already. But it's the grace of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Salvation is a gift. And by definition, a gift cannot be earned. It cannot be merited. Notice how many times the words faith and believe appear in this passage here in verses 21 through 31. We see it twice in verse 22 and then in verse 25, 26, 27, 28, and twice more in verse 30 and finally again in verse 31. And notice also the words justified, verses 24 and 28. Just, verse 26, justifier, verse 26, justify, verse 30, how they're all presented as the result of God's grace through man's faith and the sacrificial death of Christ Jesus. I mean, this must be grasped by each and every one of us, beloved. What a precious, sparkling gem is the justification of sinners by God's grace alone, through repentant faith alone, in Christ Jesus alone. And then there's a third possible bit of wrong thinking addressed by Paul at the end of this chapter. Does faith then cancel out the law, the Mosaic law. Does faith in Christ Jesus mean that, that we look at the law and just say, ah, don't have to pay attention to any of that? Well, Paul responds, may it, may it never be. As he's already mentioned in chapter 2, verses 26 and 27, and as he's going to repeat in, in chapter 8, verses 2 through 4, and chapter 13, 8 through 10, the morality expressed in the Mosaic law was never intended to be discarded by the introduction of the new covenant in Christ Jesus. In fact, the law of Christ actually includes the moral commands proclaimed in the old law of Moses. Just study the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5 through 7, that makes it very, very clear. Well, chapter 4, verses 1 through 8, we now see righteousness and justification exemplified. Notice Paul turns to the father of the Jews, Abraham, to showcase the first example of justification by faith recorded in scripture. In doing so, Paul refers to Genesis 15, 6, when indeed Abraham believed God's promises contained in the Abrahamic covenant, and that belief was credited to Abraham as righteousness. He was declared legally right, legally righteous in the eyes of God. Paul then refers to David's words in Psalm 32, 1 through 2, to emphasize the result of such justification, the forgiveness of sin. Hallelujah. And then we see the righteousness and justification extended. In chapter 4, verses 9 through 25, the question might arise in someone's mind. Well, we see Abraham as the one who believed God and was credited to him as righteousness. So does this mean that only the descendants of Abraham, the Jews, to whom the law of Moses was also given, are they the only ones? that can be justified by God's grace through faith in Christ Jesus? And Paul answers that question in three major phases. Notice that as he does so, he points back to Genesis 15, 6, twice more, verses 9 and 22. And he also points to the promises of the Abrahamic covenant that were given in Genesis 15 and 17. And he does so here in verses 17 and 18. So first, Paul points out Abraham was justified by faith while he was still uncircumcised, verses 9 through 12. And this argument would have really struck Paul's Jewish readers because circumcision was the major sign of obedience in both the Abrahamic covenant and the Mosaic covenant and inclusion in those covenants. It was so serious that the Judaizers that plagued the early church kept insisting all Christian men must be circumcised in order to be linked to the God who made those covenants with Abraham and Israel through Moses. Second, Paul points out that the promises of the Abrahamic covenant were given to both Abraham's descendants and also to people from every nation if they repentantly believed in the God of the Bible, verses 13 through 18. It is through the many nations and descendants of Abraham, Genesis 15, 5, Genesis 17, 5, that the promise of Genesis 12, 3 would be fulfilled, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. This argument would have really struck Paul's Gentile readers. It means that God always intended to bless people across the globe by bringing them into his own family. And so Paul is answering the question, no, justification is not only for the Jews. 
It is for the Gentile as well. And third, Paul points out, it is in Christ Jesus, the descendant of Abraham and the son of God, that such blessing comes about in the form of justification by faith and the forgiveness of sin. The death and resurrection of Jesus was on account of our transgressions and came about in order to declare us righteous in the eyes of God. Well, may each of us truly trust in the gift of God's grace to have justified us through our repentance and faith in the life, death, and resurrection of Christ Jesus. There is no eternal life if you are not justified. Repent and believe this very day if you have not. Believe that the Lord saves on the basis of his grace and mercy through faith in Christ's perfect life and sacrificial death and resurrection from the grave. And yet, let us also remember, faith does not cancel out the morality expressed in the Mosaic law. God expects those whom he graciously saves to now live holy, righteous lives as the result of that free gift of justification. And memory verse challenge for, for these two chapters here today is Romans 3, verses 23 and 24. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift of his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Pray that this has been a blessing today, helpful, and that we would live for the Lord faithfully and true. This has been Romans chapters 3 and 4, and I hope you have a great day.